Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, you know, this year is a big year for me because it's my 20-year high school reunion. Now, and although it has been two decades since I was in high school, I can distinctly recall a story that one of my high school teachers shared with my class. And it was a story about when he had been our age. And he told my class that when he was a teenager, there was a student in his class who was bullied and made fun of all the time. And he told us about one day, a group of bullies came up to that picked on student and they surrounded him in the school's hallway. Overpowering this young boy, they dragged him out of the building towards the school's field. Then they stripped him naked and they forced him to lay down into a net that they had prepared by the school's flagpole on the field. They wrapped the net around him, attached it to the flagpole and began to hoist him up. A student saw this happening and was outraged. So he ran to try to intervene, to try to stop the bullies from what they were doing. And the bullies were able to also overpower the second student and began to do to him what they were doing to the first. And as all that was happening, a crowd of students gathered on the field, simply watching. Within that crowd was then as a student, my teacher. And when he told my class that story, he said to us, looking back, if I could return to that moment, and if I could take the place of anyone there that day, who do you think I wish I would have been? And he answered his own question by saying the student who stood up in defense of the victimized boy. As I have thought often over the years about that story, what has struck me is that whenever an injustice occurs, whether it's the one I just described or any injustice, we have one of four roles to play. Victim, persecutor, bystander, or defender. Now we might not have a choice about that first role, that of victim, but we certainly do have a choice of which of the other three roles we will step into. Now we're gathered here today and the March for Life has drawn so many people this week to be defenders of preborn children, to take on that fourth vital role of being the hands, the feet, the voices for those who cannot defend themselves. But what makes our cause different from the cause of that one brave student who tried to stop the bullies in their harming of the other student, what, what makes our cause different from what his cause, you could say, was that he could literally run an attempt to separate the victim from the persecutors. We cannot separate the victimized preborn child or about to be victimized preborn child from the persecutors, from the woman who's considering abortion and from any of the people she would enlist to help her facilitate that abortion. For the preborn child needs to be nestled in his mother's womb. So since we cannot separate the preborn child from the situation of danger, it's our job to use our powers of persuasion to move in the heart and mind of the woman in crisis and anyone else in her circumstances so that abortion becomes unthinkable. How then do we defend preborn children well? How do we be winsome? How do we use our powers of persuasion so as to reach the heart and the mind? That's what I want to talk about in the brief time that I have with you this afternoon. And there are three things in particular that I want to focus on. The first is I want us to briefly consider what we're up against. What is the mindset of the abortion rights movement that we need to be prepared to respond to? From there, I want to then lead to how we can make a rigorous intellectual argument against abortion, thereby winning the argument. But that will lead me to the third and final thing I want to address, which is how we also reach the heart of the person we're arguing with so that we win them. Because it's not enough to just win the argument, we also need to win the person, which will be the final thing that I address. In terms of what we're up against, one of my favorite open-ended questions to ask people that I'm dialoguing with on abortion is simply this. What do you think about abortion? 
It requires more than a yes or no response and lets the other person be the first to really speak in any depth about the topic. So when I've asked people, what do you think about abortion? The vast majority of the broad secular culture and even within our churches will often say, well, I'm pro-choice. I think sometimes abortion is needed. So then I'll respond back with another question. Why? Or under what circumstances? And inevitably, what the person comes back with are a number of difficult situations a pregnant woman can find herself in. And they'll say, well, I think abortion is needed. I'm pro-choice in cases of rape. Or if a woman is poor. Or if her child is, or if she rather is really young. Or if she has no support. Or if she's trying to finish her education. And as I've heard these various difficult circumstances be presented, what has, con- what has come to my mind is that the person I'm dialoguing with is actually communicating something to me that they haven't verbalized. They're communicating something to me that they haven't verbalized. When they say I support abortion in cases of rape, poverty, being too young, and so forth, what they're really saying without saying it is, there are some really hard circumstances out there. To be pregnant and poor would be hard. To be pregnant and young and have no support would be hard. To be pregnant from sexual assault, you didn't even consent to the sex, would be really, really hard. And upon identifying that's what they're really communicating, my first response back can be one of validation. I agree with you, I'll often say. To be pregnant and poor would be hard or if their objection was, was being the mom being too young, I agree with you to be pregnant and 14 would be really, really hard. And upon validating that tr- fact, that truth, that it would be difficult to be in that circumstance, I then ask a very simple question. I say, imagine someone is pregnant, or sorry, someone is poor but not pregnant. Then they um, are already, sorry, someone is, is poor, after having given birth. So they're pregnant, they're fine, but when the baby's born, they hit some financial hard times, things get tough. I say, may we kill the born child for reasons of poverty? And what are they gonna say back? No, of course not. So then they ask, why then may we kill the pre-born child for reasons of poverty? And they say, well, that's different. The fetus isn't a person, the born child is. Ah, so what that shows me is they don't consider the preborn child to be equal to that born child in poverty, but instead they think the preborn child is inferior to the born child in poverty. So it's my job to convince them the preborn child is equal. Or if they bring up that circumstance of the mom being too young, I agree to be young would be difficult and pregnant. Let me ask you this, I'll say. Imagine someone's young and pregnant, but they don't think they're too young. They are young, but they don't think so. You know, there's whole TV, live, you know, reality TV shows built around this premise. You've got teenagers who are excited to be pregnant. And then I say, but let's imagine after the baby is born, that teenager realizes how much work children are. And she thinks, I am too young to be a parent. Would we ever allow her or anyone to kill the newborn child because the mom thinks she's too young? They will say, of course not. So then I ask, why then may we kill the preborn child because the mom thinks she's too young? That's different, they'll say. The fetus isn't human. And so again, if that's the reaction we're getting, it shows they don't think the fetus has the same humanity or dignity as the born child, which means that's the challenge put before us, to prove that the preborn child is as human as the born child. And so by drawing information out of people, what do you think, why, under what circumstances, we can hear that they're communicating concern for the woman in crisis, we can validate the difficulty, and then ask a simple question analogizing to a born child in order to demonstrate that difficult life circumstances do not permit us to end the life of vulnerable children. We have to come up with alternatives. And with pregnancy and abortion, we have to come up with an alternative to abortion if we're dealing with a preborn child who's a human being like the born child. And that's the challenge that we have. Which leads me then to my second point, which is to win the argument, to convince people that we are dealing with a living human person just like someone who's born. In order to do that, again, I like to ask an open, uh, uh, like to ask a question. I often ask, do you believe in human rights? So this time it's a yes or no uh, qu- type question. And people, when I ask that question, always say, 
Yes, yes, I believe in human rights. Now, we all have smartphones or hopefully have smartphones these days, but I'm going to use my PowerPoint today, but you could go to your smartphone and do what I'm about to do. So once they say they believe in human rights, I'll look for an image online of a one-celled embryo just after fertilization, just after sperm egg fusion. And I'll say, okay, what about this human's rights? Now, when they look at that picture, what are they going to say? That's not a human. So I ask another question. What are her parents? Is the pregnant woman human? Is her partner human? If yes, wouldn't it follow that this embryo is human as well? Because two human parents cannot produce a cat, right? It, it can't happen. You know, I worry that one day this couple's going to be in my audience. If you just go to Google image, like couple with cat, you know, there they are. But the point is, we know that two humans are only going to produce another human. And since the parents of that embryo are human, it would follow that that embryo must be human. Now, the individual not being able to really rebut that might come back from a different angle and say, well, even if technically the embryo's human, the embryo's not alive. So we ask another question. Is the embryo growing? Is the one cell growing into two? Those two into four and eight and 16 and so forth. And if yes, wouldn't it follow by the embryo's growth that the embryo's living? And if the embryo is human parents, wouldn't it follow the embryo's human? And since you believe in human rights, wouldn't it follow what we now know to be a living human has the same human rights as you or me? Now, they might respond by dropping the F word. Now, it's not the F word you're thinking, but this F word. They might say it's just a fetus. So then we ask another question. What kind of fetus? They might look perplexed and say, what do you mean, what kind of fetus? So again, use your smartphone, Google image. <laughs> draw, draw up this image from online, something like it, and say, well, what's that? And what is that? Well, it's a dolphin what? It's a dolphin fetus. And we bring that up in order to make the point the word fetus is not species specific. The word fetus tells us how old something is, not what something is. Other species have fetuses. Dolphins have fetuses. Dogs have fetuses. Humans have fetuses. So in the context of a human relationship where there's a human fetus, I'll say to the person I'm dialoguing with, when two humans are pregnant or have conceived uh, their offspring, and that offspring is a fetus, when the fetus is born, what will those humans now call the fetus? And they'll say, baby. So then I say, okay, and when that baby turns two, what will those individuals call that baby? And they say, toddler. And I'll say, okay, and when the toddler turns 13, what will they call the toddler? And I'm saying, pain in the neck, okay. <laughs> so when pain in the neck slash teenager turns 21, what do we call that individual? Even more of a pain of a ne in the neck, right? <laughs> Gone. <laughs> Gone, right. <laughs> So the point is, we humans have words to refer to age ranges within our species. And whether it's adult or teenager or toddler or baby, or whether it's fetus or embryo, these labels are telling us how old something is, not what something is. If we want to know what something is, we simply ask, what are the parents? And since the parents of the embryo are human, the embryo must be human. What I'm finding is increasingly happening, especially on college campuses, is abortion supporters are trying to say, well, even if technically the embryo's human, the embryo's not a person. So then I'll ask, well, what is a person? How would you define person? And inevitably, the type of definition I get back is something like this. The abortion supporter will say, well, the embryo's too small to be a person. Or a person is someone who can think, reason, and feel pain and the embryo can't do those things. Or a person is someone who is independent, and the embryo can't live on its own. If we think about that type of definition, however, that definition excludes not just pre-born individuals, but some born individuals. Newborn children are smaller than all of us, but we would never say they're not persons. Newborn children cannot think or reason cannot have complex communications and conversations with us, and yet we don't deprive newborn children of their personhood status. There are some humans who have a rare condition called congenital insensitivity to pain, where they can't feel pain. Yet we would never deprive those born individuals of personhood status just because they can't feel pain.
And we know there are many born individuals who can't live on their own. Yes, we could leave a newborn child in this room for a nap and walk out and come back and the child would be alive. But if we left the child to nap for a week and didn't return until seven days had passed, we're not going to find a living child because the child cannot survive on her own. We would never deprive the newborn child of personhood status because of her inability to survive on her own. So why would we deprive the preborn child of personhood status just because of her inability to survive on her own? Interestingly, the United Nations, which is often perceived as a pro-abortion organization, nonetheless, if you look at its foundational documents, they express pro-life sentiments. In the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, they say everyone has the right to life. They also say everyone has the right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law. Well, who's everyone? Well, in the preamble of that document, it says that it's referencing all members of the human family. In other words, all members of the human family have the right to life, all members of the human family ought to be considered persons. And since we know now that the embryo of human parents is a member of the human family, according to that document by the UN, that means they have the right to life and they ought to be considered persons everywhere. When I was once debating a philosophy professor, he brought forward an a newer argument that is making its way into the abortion debate. He said, I'm going to concede for the sake of discussion that the embryo is a human person like you or me, but I'm going to still justify abortion on the grounds that human persons like you or me don't have a right to use another human person's body without their consent. He said, let me give you an example. He said, imagine you have a child you love dearly and your child is dying of kidney disease. And the only thing that will save your child's life is a kidney transplant. So imagine that um, you find out that you're the only person in the world with the right body type to be able to donate a kidney to save your child's life. He said, would it be nice of you to save your child's life? Yes. Would it kill you to donate one of your kidneys to do this? No. But should the law force you as a parent to give one of your kidneys to your child? No, he said it should not. And just as the law should not force a parent to give a kidney to a child, the law should not force a parent to give a uterus to the child. What do we do? Well, as a person of faith, I sat at the front, taking notes, looking calm, cool, and collected on the outside, but got a little panicky inside and began to pray. And so I was like, come Holy Spirit, I need some divine inspiration. <coughs> and I sensed God speak to me, not audibly, but I sensed that he said these very words, Stephanie, I made the uterus for a different purpose. And I began to reflect on that and what that meant and what the Holy Spirit was telling me. And then I got clarity right when it was my time to get up. So I get up in front of these 200 students. I say, Dr. Snedden makes a very compelling argument until we ask ourselves a question. And the question we have to ask ourselves is this. What is the nature and purpose of the kidney versus the nature and purpose of the uterus? Because when we answer that question, we come to see why a parent is not legally obligated to give their kidney, but ought to be legally obligated to give their uterus. I said, the kidney exists in my body for my body. The uterus, I said, is very different. It's an organ unique from all the others in that it exists in my body every single month getting ready for someone else's body. My uterus exists more for my offspring than it exists for me. I can live without my uterus, but my offspring cannot. And they can therefore claim a right to the organ made more for them than they could make a claim to a right to the kidney. <coughs> Lots of power of prayer in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> So the point is that we can very much win the argument 
with reason, with science, with philosophy, with good questions. And yet every now and then we're going to find ourselves in a situation where someone seems unconvinced, which leads me to the third point I wanted to address today. How do we move from simply winning the argument to winning the person? A few years ago, I was on a college campus, and during Q&A, a student got to the microphone and said, what about rape? What about someone who hasn't consented to sex? Now she's pregnant. She's going to be traumatized by this. She should be allowed to have an abortion. And in responding to her, as I often do when asked this question, I began by validating the injustice that has gone on, the need to help the woman, to be compassionate, to have more serious consequences for the rapist, to acknowledge the difficulty of the situation. And then I asked a question. Is it fair to give the death penalty to the innocent child? Some people have been provoked to profound thought by that one simple question. This girl was not. She said, yeah, but, and, and rejected what I'd said. So I said, I thought, well, I, I can give a little more detailed answer. So I said, okay, well, imagine this. I thought, I'll tell a story. I said, imagine you have woman, a woman who has consensual sex with her husband on Monday, and then Tuesday, walking home from work late at night, she is raped by a stranger. So that in one month's time, when she finds out she's pregnant, she won't know in that moment whether the father of her child is the husband or the rapist. So I said, let's say she hopes it's her husband's child and carries through with the pregnancy. After the baby is born, they do a paternity test. Test results come back and reveal the child's father is not her husband. It's the rapist. Would we ever allow that woman or anyone to kill the newborn child because of the father's crime? She said, no. I said, why then would we allow anyone to kill the preborn child because of the father's crime? And she said, yeah, but that would never happen. You made that up. Like, that would never happen. So then I thought, well, I've got more. So I said, well, actually, I said, there was a New York Times article several years ago interviewing an abortionist. And in this article, it said Dr. Wickland, the abortionist, described her horror when she aborted the pregnancy of a woman who had been raped only to discover after, when examining the removed tissue to make sure she got all the parts out, that the pregnancy was further along than she or the woman had thought, and that she had just aborted an embryo the woman and her husband had conceived together. Even the abortionist, I said to this student, was horrified. If it's horrifying to kill a child conceived in love, isn't it equally horrifying to kill a child conceived in violence if in both cases we're dealing with a child? Yeah, but, she said, and nothing was getting through. And I finally had to very gently say, I would be happy to engage you one-on-one, -on -one, but there's a long line of people behind you with questions. And to be fair to them, I'm going to have to give them a turn at the microphone. But I said, at the end, please feel free to approach me. I'd be happy to keep talking about this. So she understood. She sat down. I took the other questions. The event ended. The moment it ended, boom, she's at the, micro, uh, at the podium. She wants to speak with me. And as we go back and forth, I started to wonder, could I be talking to a victim of sexual assault? Is it possible she's focused like a laser beam on this one circumstance because it touches her so intimately? And even if not her, perhaps someone she cares about and is close to. And so at one point as we were carrying on the discussion, I said to her, you know, I have a friend who was molested as a child and I am about one of five people who know this. She's never told her parents that this happened. And I said, because so few of us know, I said, I really journeyed with my friend to find healing. And I went to counseling with her. And I said, I'll be upfront and honest. She never got pregnant. I said, she was too young. But I said, I bring this up to say that as I journeyed with my friend, what became very clear to me, is that when someone has been violated in such a profound way, whether they get pregnant or not, they've been traumatized and an abortion is not going to take that trauma away. And she looked at me with a profound sadness and knowing in her eyes and said, yeah, 10 years and counting. And I just looked at her and said, I am so sorry for your suffering. And at that point, the whole 
direction of our conversation changed. It went from an academic intellectual discussion up here to a how are you doing down here? I asked if she was safe or if the person who hurt her was still in her life. Eventually, I asked her how she was doing emotionally. Did she feel she got adequate counseling or did she need to be connected to a place that could further help her find healing? And I saw that girl soften and open up before my eyes. And what struck me as I reflect on that encounter with her is that my friends over at a pro-life group called Justice for All have said, when someone asks about rape, they're not asking if the baby is human. They're asking if the pro-lifer is human. Do we care and convey our care for the person in front of us as much as we rightly care for and convey the care for the child in the womb? There's a powerful book called Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion. And in this book, it asks the reader to imagine three buckets of water in front of them. One has cold water in it, one has lukewarm, and one has hot. Imagine I put my right hand in the hot water and my left hand in the cold water. And after about a minute, I take them both out and put them in the middle bucket. The hand which came from the cold water is going to think the new bucket of water is hot. The hand which came from the hot water is going to think the new bucket of water is cold. Interestingly, both of them are wrong. It's lukewarm. But the previous experience colors the present interpretation. And when we're dialoguing with people and having a hard time reaching their minds, we want to pause, we want to pray, and we want to ask the Holy Spirit for wisdom to discern what temperature the bucket of water was before they encountered us. Where are they coming from? What's their story? I was once dialoguing with a very angry student who was yelling, swearing, barely giving me pause to say anything. And so finally, when there was a little window of opportunity, I just looked at him and very slowly and quietly said, Noah, what does someone who thinks like you want someone who thinks like me to understand. Give the other person an opportunity to express where they're coming from. Another good open-ended question is to say, I'm curious, where does your passion come from? Or another question that can be asked is, what's your earliest memory of learning about abortion and what did you think then? What do you think now? Oh, when did it change? Oh, I'm curious. What factors influence that change? And it's amazing the stories people will tell, which helps us to understand where they're coming from and be present to them in their pain. I have met so many students who have revealed to me profound traumas. One student told me about both of his parents being crystal meth addicts and being bounced around the foster care system. Another student I met told me that the night before, the only relative she was close to, because she was also bounced around the foster care system, was a cousin who had just committed suicide. Another student I met told me the week prior she'd been at a party, felt sick, fell asleep, and woke up being raped. Another student told me he'd been sodomized as a child. And as I have encountered the brokenness and the woundedness in the culture, it has reminded me that as important as it is that we be prepared to reach the minds, we must have such tender hearts. And we must have such wisdom to know, I need to set that aside. The agenda I thought I was here for, I'm going to just put that down for a moment. And I'm going to listen to this person. And I'm going to let them tell me their story. And I'm going to let the Spirit guide the rest of that conversation. I want to wrap things up, ending where I began, speaking about when an injustice occurs, it's so important we play the role of defender. And I'm reminded of a physician who called me several years ago because a patient of hers, just shy of the 20th week of pregnancy, halfway through, had gone to an ultrasound clinic where she found out she was pregnant with a girl. And she didn't want a girl, and she wanted an abortion. And so this doctor called me for help for how to change her mind, how to interact with the patient. So I provided a lot of information to win the argument, 
but also guidance for how to win the person and what she could share and how to share it. And then I connected her to a Mandarin-speaking physician in her city who she met with and strategized about interacting further with this patient. And again, being a person of faith, this physician um, entered into prayer the night before she had a follow-up appointment scheduled. And as she was praying, really sensed God say to her, let this woman know how much I love her. So the next day, the doctor went to work. The end of the day was when she had the follow-up appointment scheduled. And she, the patient came in, and her first approach was really the prayer of St. Francis, the peace prayer, it's often called. And midway through that prayer, we say, O oh, Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be understood as to understand. And so the doctor's first approach was to say, why do you want this abortion? And the patient opened up and revealed something to her doctor she'd never told her before. And that was the abusive home that she had come from. When she was a young girl, she was taught to believe her life was meaningless because she was a girl. There was a little closet in the family home that she was routinely locked up in, deprived of food, water, and the toilet. And then when it got really cold outside, her family would let her out of that closet in order to open the front door and force her to stand outside. All because she was a girl. And when the doctor heard all of this, she thought, this woman doesn't want to kill a girl. This woman wants to spare a girl the suffering and torture she lived through. Now, she's wrong that she would repeat the cycle. She's wrong that abortion is the solution. But in her traumatized state, that's where her mind went. And in seeking to understand what's behind that, how do I not just win the argument, but win the person? The doctor drew out of the patient the real concern and was able to guide her to another way. That patient said she felt her doctor was the first person she'd ever met who authentically cared about her. And several months later, at Easter, a baby girl was born. All because that physician knew the mindset she was up against, had a very strong mind and was well-equipped, but also had a very tender heart, knowing that she'd never win the argument unless she first won the person. And when she won the person, the baby lived. It's my hope and prayer that we follow her example, we apply the strategies that I've suggested, and we defend well the youngest among us. Thank you very much.